Good morning and welcome to our program here at St. Clair Southern Baptist Church. Maybe I should say our broadcast. This is our first time to do this through our Facebook page, and we hope this will be clear and understandable and help you as we face some very difficult times. If you've got your Bible, would you please open it to Psalm 91? We'll be looking at several verses from Psalm 91. As we speak to you this morning about this coronavirus problem and crisis that is gripping our country, normally I preach in a series of messages built around a book of the Bible or a particular theme or topic, but today I want to take this time to speak to this issue because it is so much on the hearts and minds of believers all across our country and across our world. Something like this happened back 19 years ago when I spoke here in this pulpit about the problem that happened on 9-11 when our country was under attack. That problem was more restricted to a particular part of our country, whereas today this coronavirus is a problem that affects people all across our country and across the world. So today we find ourselves facing something that has affected people all across the world, and it has created a, a great deal of confusion and fear and doubt with many questions, and we have not even seen the end of it yet. It's still moving at a very rapid clip. It is affecting thousands upon thousands of people, and thousands upon thousands of people are dying from this, and we really don't know what will be the final outcome of this, not just in the physical sense of the illness, but also how the consequences of this illness have affected everyone in their jobs, in their towns, in their, in their own personal finances. And I'm convinced that perhaps one of the bigger part of the problems is not so much the virus itself as the fear surrounding this virus. The estimates from our experts tell us that somewhere at least 98% or maybe even 99% of people who will receive this will definitely rec re will recover from it and not die from it. And the truth is that most people will not receive this virus from what I'm hearing from our news reports. But from all of these things that are going on, it is changing people's lives without a doubt. And to be honest with you, it's something that you haven't experienced before. I've never seen anything like this before. Most of you who are listening to me will not get this uh, virus, thankfully, and we're grateful to God for that. It's actually a small number of people percentage-wise who will receive this, and I do not mean to play down the importance of lives that are lost because of this virus. As I said, the vast majority of those who do get this virus will recover. And yet the implications of this are frightening to people because this takes life out of their control. And if there's one thing we know about people, they want to be in control of things. But I want to give you some things to think about today from the Word of God that are meant to be helpful to you. I was able to share some of these ideas with a men's group not too long ago, and I would like to share them with all of you that are listening through our Facebook page. We are recording this, so if you're not able to hear this on Sunday morning, March 29th at 11 a.m., we will be allowing that to be through, available through our Facebook page to hear it at other times at your convenience. Folks, without a doubt, even the most skeptical deniers of this crisis have had to face up to the fact that billion-dollar industries do not just shut down their operations and change their business models in ways that will cost them millions, if not billions, of dollars without being convinced that this threat is very real, it is very serious, and it's serious enough to deserve this kind of risk being taken. You know this here in this part of the country. Many, many schools are closed now, and with many wondering if the school you will even be able to finish this year on time with any kind of graduation. Our president has invoked what is called the Stafford Act to call for a state of national emergency. State and local governments and authorities are preparing all kinds of emergency protocols as experts warn us that our medical infrastructures will not be able to address all of the needs that are facing us in the coming days. And I can't help but wonder if skepticism is no longer a threat that if most people believe this is real, and I think most people should believe this is real because these are real people that are dying, if, if skepticism is not that much of a threat anymore or a danger, I do believe panic is 
a great danger and threat that we're facing. And I wonder which danger is worse, skepticism or panic? Well, I hope you found your place in Psalm 91. I want to read to you, starting in verse 1, a few verses that we will look at here this morning that I hope will speak to you and remind you of some things concerning the people of God. And the writer says this in verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Please notice that word, pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence, there's that word again, that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. And now would you drop down to verse 9 of Psalm 91 and follow along as I read. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you. Nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. That's an interesting word, plague. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Would you please pray with me at this moment? Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit inspiring it to be written long ago. And how it spoke to people way back then and it still speaks to us today. And oh Father, how we need to hear this word from you. That you have promised to keep your hand, your protection, your strength and your power on those who love you, follow you and obey you. It does not mean God that we will not have problems. But it does mean that when the problems come, you are with us in the problems. And you have promised to walk with us through the problems. We would pray, God, that your people all across the United States and all across the world would hear this truth, that our God is a mighty God. Our God is a big God, the all-powerful, almighty God, who is more than able to cure a virus, to stop a virus, to help those who are sick, to restore jobs and businesses and homes and families to bring people together, to stop the death of this. God, you are more than able to do all these things. And we pray that you would if you so desire. But Lord, if there's something you are desiring to show us and teach us, and that we would learn this, may we learn that as well. We pray for churches everywhere that are not able to meet, for empty church houses and sanctuaries and auditoriums where we're not allowed these days because of safety's sake to meet dear God would you please bring us back soon as soon as possible so that we would unite again and rejoin our brothers and sisters in love joy and fellowship around the word of God dear God would you hear our prayer and we pray these things in Christ's name amen the question I asked was which danger is worse skepticism or panic well I want to give you some ways to think as a Christian as a believer in Christ should think about this coronavirus COVID-19 as it is called as well as any problem or any situation that comes along that we face that is difficult and even dangerous the first thought I want to leave or give you rather this morning is that we must always remember the God who raises the dead. Christians are not free to give in to either panic or skepticism. Believers in Christ, 
brothers and sisters in Christ, should be the ultimate realist because we know the real God. Not a false God, but the one and true real God. That knowledge of knowing the real God keeps us from denying facts. It also keeps us from giving in to fear. We know what Paul wrote to Timothy a long time ago, that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. In other words, we must think and respond and live and behave like Christians. Whenever the news of a pandemic or an epidemic or a crisis comes along, we should respond like Christians, like people who know that God raises the dead. Now, that does involve many things, I admit. But the heart of our response should be an unshakable confidence in the God who raises the dead. Here we are just a couple weeks or so from Easter. And yes, I'll admit, I hope we're able to meet Easter. And I'm praying that God will so change things in the world that believers all across the world will be able to meet in houses of worship all over to celebrate the great resurrection of our Lord and Savior. But our confidence is in God who raises the dead. Our great God loves us so much that he has given up his son for us. He who did not spare him, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also freely give us all things, Paul asks in Romans 8. What this means is that since the Lord has already given us the son of his love, we know that he will not withhold anything, anything from us which we need, even a vaccine or cure or treatment or medication to kill a virus that is affecting thousands of people. We know this because our God is sovereign. That means our God is in control of everything. The Bible tells us in Matthew 10 and verse 29, not even so much as a little sparrow falls to the ground apart from his will. Not only does he know that, but he allows that or decrees that. As the great preacher from many years ago, George Whitfield, once said, we are immortal until our work on earth is done. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, friends, that is a sure hope that comes from knowing that our good and sovereign God has reconciled us to himself through our crucified and risen Savior, and we seek to live humbly and boldly and wisely in this world of sin and death and, yes, even viruses. This Psalm 91 is full of instruction. It is full of comfort for God's people as we seek to live like this, humbly and boldly and wisely in a sinful world, a world filled with death and viruses. The whole Psalm deserves our time and meditation. I would encourage you today, after this broadcast is over, that you would read the entire Psalm. I left out a few verses, but I would hope you would read the whole Psalm. It's worthy of your time. It's worthy of you thinking over, especially in days like these. But these first six verses that I read to you are especially relevant, and they especially apply to our current situation. The writer talks about dwelling in the secret place of the Most High in verse 1, abiding under the shadow of the Almighty, saying of God in verse 2, He is my refuge. He is my fortress. My God in whom I will trust. And then the writer says that God will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. And and verse 3, I mentioned this word. I called your attention to it. And from the perilous pestilence. The writer says that Christians should seek to dwell in the shelter of God. And abide under his shadow there in verse 1. Well, how do you do this? How do you dwell in the shelter of God and abide under a shadow? Does this mean you stay in the church house all the time and never leave? That's not what it means. Here's how we do this. We do this by faith. We do this by taking God at his word. We do this by believing and remembering what he has told us and what he promises us in Christ. He has promised us many things in Christ. And we know this, folks, that God always keeps his promises. 
Verses 3 and 6 tell us that he delivers us even from the deadly pestilence. That word pestilence in verse 3 and verse 6 means diseases, plagues, epidemics. And please understand the coronavirus is not the first one that we've ever experienced as, as a race of people. And it certainly won't be the last one we ever experience. In verse 10, he says, he will del deliver us from the plague. Now, does this mean that no Christian will ever die of disease? That's not at all what Psalm 91 says. What it does mean is that what George Whitfield said is true long ago. God has our lives in his hand, and there is no virus that will ever overrule his eternal purpose, including the day that has been appointed for our death. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed unto man once to die. God controls that. He controls when we're born, and God controls when we die. Now, this does not mean that this is some sort of license for a Christian to be careless or nonchalant about the coronavirus. It doesn't mean that at all. We should take the right precautions, and we should listen to medical and governmental authorities that God in His wisdom and goodness has given to us. But as we listen, as we pay attention to, to wise counsel, good counsel, good advice, and as we take precautions and we use the good medical gifts that God has given us, like doctors and nurses and hospitals and medicines, we do so without letting our trust shift from Him, from God, to those gifts. In other words, we must be careful to love and trust the giver of those gifts more than the gifts He gives. That's a key thing in these days. Our hope and our trust is not in hospitals and medications and doctors and, and treatments. It's not, folks. Our trust and our hope is in God. And that is a challenge that we constantly face, isn't it? God has been so good to us in so many ways. He has showered us with so many good gifts. He has given us so much, at least in this part of the world, that we are regularly tempted to think that it is the Tylenol that takes away our fever, not God. It's the doctor who gave us the right treatment, not God. When we fall into this kind of thinking, when we get sick, our, our first and sometimes our only thoughts tend to be what we really need is medicine instead of God. Ladies and gentlemen, whether it's a, a simple cut of your finger or a headache or stubbing your toe, here's the truth of it. We need God more than we need anything else. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, and verse 12, we read of a good king named King Asa. But in spite of his goodness as a king, he still committed a sin. And here was his sin. If you know the story, he became diseased in his feet. And 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 12 says, Even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but he sought help from physicians. Now, some of you know that my background was in the pre-medical world back in my college days. And I knew guys that were in classes with me who had what we often called a God complex. They thought they could fix anything because they were of such a sound medical mind and so sharp when it came to physiology and anatomy and pharmacology that they thought they could fix anything. Never realizing that the only time anybody ever gets better, ever gets better from any disease or injury or illness is because God makes that so. He either allows it, wills it, or he creates the cure. In and through every precaution that we take as believers, we must remind each other to remember our God and our Father in heaven. We pray to Him, we trust Him, we hope in Him as we take the right measures in the face of even this coronavirus. Now churches are facing this question today about whether or not we should meet in regular gatherings. Pastors across the country in our states, our nation, our communities, and various places around the world are grappling with this issue. And I certainly am myself. I, I don't enjoy the fact that we're not together. I don't enjoy that at all. I miss my brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes, we can communicate the gospel through internet and radio and television and print and all kinds of ways. But ladies and gentlemen, it is not the same as to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It is not the same. And you know that this is now the second Sunday in a row we have not met. And I know some churches have already planned not to meet for several weeks. Others are asking their members to meet in 
smaller gatherings at home. Some have only slightly altered their schedules. They've changed things like we did the last time we were together where we did not shake hands, we did not hug, we took our offering in a different way. We had our men at the back standing there to receive it instead of passing the plate around. And to that I simply say that each church must exercise wisdom in making those decisions. And no church should stand in judgment on what any church decides about these kinds of important issues. And the same is true for individual Christians in the same church. During this season of unusual pandemic, some people may choose wisely not to gather at all, even in small meetings of believers. Others may be just as wise in choosing to gather in meetings like that. Through it all, Christians should pray for one another, talk to one another, communicate to one another, encourage one another, call on each other, check up on each other, stay in touch with one another to remember Jesus Christ to resist giving in to fear, and to do whatever we do out of faith in God, in Christ, and with a desire to see God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit glorified even as we are in our homes or gathering wherever we gather. Well, not only must we remember that we serve a God who raises the dead, there's something else we must bring to bear here, and that is... We must love our neighbor. We said something very similar to this in our, news, our online newsletter edition, which I hope those of you listening by Facebook will take a look at. Because you see, the measures that government officials and businesses and churches are taking, I understand they seem very drastic in, in, in many ways. I, I get that. But the reason these measures are being taken as precautions is because this virus is so very contagious, so very, very contagious. That's why it's spreading so quickly. Researchers and scientists are still discovering its characteristics, and they're making new recommendations about how to fight this virus. It seems like we can't get ahead of this thing. It seems like it's just ahead of us. As Christians, we should do what we can to help stop the spread of the disease, and that means some basic Common sense precautions, which are always relevant and useful and helpful. And I know you've heard some of these things. Because you see, folks, God has given us a mind to be used, not just to take up space between our ears, but to use some common sense, things like you've heard. Washing your hands, often, thoroughly. Uh, some folks want to go the hand sanitizer route. Covering your mouth when you cough or you sneeze. Washing your hands again as it is necessary. How about this idea? If you're si sick or have a fever, then stay home and, and seek the medical attention that you need. Here's another idea, getting plenty of rest, staying hydrated, making sure you get enough fluids, enough water in you, eating better, healthfully, not, not, not terribly, but healthfully. And even for a while, for a season, as much as it's difficult to give up hugging and shaking hands, folks, this is not forever, it's just for now, for the time being. And even to listen to trustworthy sources for updates about the spread of the virus and how to respond, things like the folks at the Center for Disease Control. And you see, these things are not only for your own sake, but also for the sake of others, caring about others. These are simple ways we can show our care for each other. It's an expression of the love of a neighbor to take such precautions. And please understand, our neighbors are every one who comes across our path, not just those who live beside us in our homes. And now I, I must say something else about how this fear and panic go together, and they, and they certainly do. Even as fear may begin to go away, it gives way to more and more panic. You've seen the stories. People trying to buy out everything they can, store up as much as they can. But please know this, God's people must remember to show love to our neighbors. Love that is motivated by our supreme love for Him. That's why we love each other, because Jesus said the two greatest commandments are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two greatest commandments. Now, we can do this because we ourselves have been loved at such a great cost, and in a way, 
that results in being reconciled to our Creator. Think about how God loved you, as John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world, that's people like us in this world, so much that He gave us His only begotten Son. So, I hope you'll take this counsel to heart, and I hope it will help you. It goes like this. When other people hoard and stock up and won't share, well, we will share as Christians. When other people steal, we will give. When other people hide, we will serve. When other people give in and cave in to fear, we will take comfort in the hope of knowing that our God loves us. That our God is for us. And God raises people from the dead like He did His Son, Jesus. In our hearts, we honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared, as Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15, to make a defense to anyone who asks us for a reason for the hope that is in us. Why do you believe this? Why do you trust us? Well, we're ready to give that answer. And Peter says we do it with gentleness and we do it with respect. I close with a quote from many years ago, almost 500 years ago. It was an open letter that the great reformer Martin Luther wrote on whether one may flee from a deadly plague. That was the title of what he wrote, whether one may flee from a deadly plague. He was asked that question as the bubonic plague came to the area he served in 1527, almost 500 years ago. He gave many pieces of wise practical counsel, and in his counsel, he included this word, this bit of encouragement, admonition, or maybe even warning, you could say, to those who came to different decisions about whether they should stay or run for it. You understand the bubonic plague killed many, 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 many people. Pastors who stayed in their communities back in those days would do as many as 20 or 30 funerals a week, sometimes many funerals in a single day because so many people died so quickly. Here's what Luther had to say about this. He said, We must pray against every form of evil and guard against it to the best of our ability in order not to act contrary to God as was previously explained. If it be God's will that evil come upon us and destroy us, none of our precautions will help us. Everybody must take this to heart. First of all, if he feels bound to stay where death rages in order to serve his neighbor, let him commend himself to God and say, Lord, I am in your hands. You have kept me here. Your will be done. I am your holy creature. You can kill me or preserve me in this pestilence, in the same way as if I were in fire, water, drought, or any other danger. Unquote. He goes on to say, if a man is free, however, and can escape, let him commend himself and say, Lord God, I am weak and fearful. Therefore, I am running away from this evil and am doing what I can to protect myself against it. I am nevertheless in your hands in this danger as in any other which might overtake me. Your will be done. My flight alone will not succeed of itself because calamity and harm are everywhere. Moreover, the devil never sleeps. He is a murderer from the beginning, as you said, Jesus, in John 8, 44. And he tries everywhere to instigate murder and misfortune. Unquote. My prayer for you as a follower and a believer and a servant of Christ is for God to enable all of us to live like people who know the risen Savior and whose hope is anchored and based steadfastly and strongly in Him. I want you to remember your father, your family, and your future. We have enough trouble, folks. We don't need to borrow any from the future. 
We need to remember who our Father is as Christians. Our Father is God. We need to remember that we belong to His family that's forever. I understand health and jobs and money and kids and all these difficulties. I understand. They can bring us trouble. I, I get that. But it's more than it's ever been in human history. And we have to admit that. And this, this virus is a good illustration of it. But I want you to know, folks, we have great hope. We have great reason to hope. We are not people without hope. Paul writes about that in 1 Thessalonians, that we are not as those who have no hope. I leave you with that passage if you would want to turn there. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And Paul is writing to a church that is wondering about the end times. And he has these great words to say that I want to leave with you. And then we'll pray. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. There it is. He says, I don't want you to be feeling like that. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. He tells us, folks, this world is not our home. Heaven is. Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in Him. And if you're listening to this broadcast and you're not saved, I would ask that you would call our church, speak to me or someone about how to become a Christian. What does it mean to be saved? How can I know for sure that God has changed me? I promise you, if you seek Him, you will find Him. Would you pray with me, please? Father, again, thank you for this privilege. We pray that you would bless this broadcast in every place where your word is going out, from Old or New Testament, either one, whichever, that it would bless and help and reach people and give them comfort and strength and hope in you, not in things of this world, but in you. And for those that are not saved, that Jesus, they would say they need you more than anything else, more than anyone else. Dear God, would you use this crisis Yes, even this crisis, to turn people's hearts to you. And for those of us that are saved, that our hearts would be turned to you and tuned to you even more. Even more than we ever have. Trusting you more, loving you more, following you more, and obeying you more. For your sake, for your glory, and for our good, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.